Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute. Uh, my name is John Lanchowski. I'm president of the Institute. And for those of you who are new here, uh, you should be aware that we are a, an independent graduate school of international affairs and national security. We have five master's degree programs. We have a brand new professional doctorate, which is the first doctoral program in national security in the country. Uh, we uh, uh, have a student body of recent college graduates, and, and about half our students are mid-career professionals from the various agencies of the government, the armed services, and so on. Uh, we specialize in teaching the different arts of statecraft, by which we mean the instruments of national power, uh, diplomacy, public diplomacy, intelligence, counterintelligence, military strategy, economic strategy, cyber strategy, and all of these other instruments in the larger orchestra of our overall foreign policy. And we are encouraging our students uh, to engage in integrated strategic thinking, and we are hoping that someday in the future there will be conductors of the orchestra who will be aware of all the sections of the orchestra, uh, because not all of them are. And um, so uh, we're having a lot of fun um, with our faculty of scholar practitioners, uh, and we're unique in that sense that we have a disproportionate number of people who have actually done what they teach. Uh, doing the teaching around here. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a man who is, in his own way, a scholar practitioner who uh, came out of the tradition of, of serious national security mindedness in the academic world, having had an association with the estimable Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. John Lehman. Um, is an author, he's an investment banker, he's the founder of the J.F. Lehman Company. Uh, he's been in all sorts of, uh, involved in all sorts of aspects of, of private equity investment and management since that company's inception. Um, what is particularly special about John for me and many of us on the faculty is that he was our colleague in the Reagan administration having served as an incredibly dynamic Secretary of the Navy from 1981 to 1987, where he was responsible for managing over a million people, uh, a budget close to $100 billion, uh, and he was the, one of the most vigorous champions of developing a serious, as he put it, a 600-ship Navy that would have a major major uh, uh, global power projection capabilities, and particularly to help uh, strengthen the deterrent uh, forces of the United States so that we would not be vulnerable to Soviet nuclear blackmail uh, and, and other Soviet operations. Um, after, uh, well, prior to that, and maybe even a little bit after, he. Uh, uh, Dr. Lehman was president of the aerospace consulting company, the Abington Corporation. He has served as a delegate to the Mutual and Balanced Force Reduction Negotiations. He was deputy director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and he served as a senior uh, NSC staff member under, uh, under uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger's uh, uh, NSC staff. He was also a member of the 9-11 Commission, uh, and uh, he flew various tactical aircraft as a member of the uh, U.S. Naval Reserve. Uh, there's a lot more I could say about him, but he has the important things to say. John, we're honored that you would come and visit us, and he's a member of our advisory board here, too. So thank you so much. Thank you, John. This is, uh, again, a real pleasure to be back, and I have a real pleasure to talk about my new book. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's why I'm here, and I want to tell you why I wrote this book. I wrote it because nobody else did. And uh, uh, I, I, I got increasingly frustrated at the fact that the accepted wisdom has become over the years that 
uh, Mr. Gorbachev deserves all the credit for the end of the Cold War, and that uh, the Soviet Union would have crumbled anyway. The economy was such a basket case. And certainly Ronald Reagan had nothing to do with it, and of course the Navy had nothing to do with it. Well, of course, these things are just not true, and the reality is that we'd still be in the Cold War if it weren't for Ronald Reagan and the way he decided, the way he rallied the West to recognize the huge advantages that were inherent in our governmental system in the West. And not only that, but the realities of geography. It, it, it was a, a, quite a, an interesting phenomenon that someday somebody will write uh, write about, not, uh, not me, but the, the fact is that here was the world's greatest peacetime alliance in NATO that was in, in control of the, the strongest economies that the world has ever seen, the most creative uh, peoples, and, uh, and they, uh, the NATO alliance uh, had command of the seas uh, uh, by, uh, by geography. If you look at a map, our adversary, the Soviet Union, is a landlocked Eurasian uh, 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 power on the Eurasian central uh, world island and surrounded by the world's oceans. But they have no warm water ports and most of their land is above the 50th parallel. Bad, bad agriculture, uh, su surprisingly few natural resources, no warm water ports, yet they were utterly dependent on the West for food, for agricultural products, and uh, for uh, many other things. Yet, by uh, the uh, 70s, it, NATO had lost its confidence. NATO had, had become almost defeatist because they had been faced, it had settled in that uh, the central front of Europe, where the land uh, balance was most visible, the, the Soviet Union had 180 divisions active duty, and most NATO could generate on, uh, peacetime, on a peacetime basis was 40. And so the argument had become in NATO councils that uh, how not how do we win, but uh, how long will it take us to lose? Literally, that was the, those were the internal debates. It was all about how can we delay them from getting to the channel. The optimists said we could delay them three weeks uh, before we have to go nuclear. And the pessimists said in a week they'll be at the English Channel. Well, then uh, the strategy became flexible response, which was a mutual suicide pact. Uh, we were going to go nuclear. Since we weren't going to match the land forces and the North German plain uh, favored in the geography, the offensive uh, uh, motorized uh, uh, infantry and armored divisions of the Warsaw Pact, and so we would have to go nuclear. Well, the Russians, not surprisingly, did not see any difference between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. Because for them, uh, any nuclear weapon landing in the Western Soviet Union was very strategic. And yet we deluded ourselves to think that uh, that would uh, stop them from using conventional weapons. And increasingly, Brezhnev and the Soviet leadership realized that that was not that it wasn't deterring. It was not going to deter them. And so they were able to start translating their huge imbalance in land forces into uh, invading Czechoslovakia, uh, going into Afghanistan, sending uh, 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 support and uh, advisors uh, into Central America and into uh, El Salvador and uh, the Sandinistas, uh, not to mention Cuba, they were very much on the march, and they declared they bragged about it. They declared the Brezhnev Doctrine. It is the Soviets' right to go into any country 
that, uh, that uh, threatened uh, uh, socialism. And not a word in NATO councils about the advantages that NATO had. It was, if you were, um, some of you, most of you here are way too young to remember this, but the media at the time, and, and uh, except for islands of, of real intellectual rigor like uh, the, uh, uh, the current institute for world politics, were writing learned tomes about how we had to accommodate with the Soviets. They really had a better medical uh, system for all, they had better education, they uh, were able to ma uh, deploy this huge military capability with only, and this was the CIA's estimate, national estimate, with only 7 to 8 percent of their GDP, they were able to uh, deploy a 1,700 ship fleet and this massive land imbalance. And, uh, and so there was a, 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 a kind of acceptance that uh, the West Day was, was over and that uh, clearly we had to start converging with the Soviets. Now this, this did not pervade the public so much as the intelligentsia, the, the elites. And many of us were just shaking our heads. How can this be? Doesn't anybody ever look at a map? 70% uh, of the world's surface is covered with, uh, with the seas, and, and we have the great navies of the world, not them. Yes, they're trying to achieve naval superiority, but we don't even talk about it. And we had become so defeatist that, in fact, NATO had decreed that no major exercises could be any more held above uh, the GIUK gap, the Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom uh, gap, because that was getting too close to the Soviets' uh, most strategic uh, uh, territory. So for 20 years, we never exercised up there in any large-scale exercise because that would disturb detente. And yet, um, you know, it, it just, how could this have come about? Uh, it's the Soviets that should be on the defensive. It's Warsaw Pact that should look at a map and say, how can we possibly challenge the West? And uh, uh, so uh, it was into this context that uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, after he lost the, the 76 uh, nomination, he, uh, 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 he, he really went to school. He really uh, started to read deeply into the realist philosophers and political theorists uh, like Henry Kissinger and historians, and like Sam Huntington at Harvard, like Robert Strauss at Pei and Bill Kintner and, at the FPRI and really thinking about strategy, because he felt absolutely that he, the reason he wanted to run for president uh, was so that he could wake people up to the advantages that the West had. And so uh, he, he traveled around. He met with like-minded leaders like Helmut Schmidt in Germany and, and uh, Maggie Thatcher. <coughs> and he went to Japan. And, uh, uh, and then. Uh, and then he came back and gathered around a group of advisors, including some of the people that I mentioned, and, uh, 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 and went to school on strategy. And he understood, which uh, a num perhaps most of our presidents since uh, his tenure have not understood, which is you have to start with strategy, with a strategic view of the world and how you order your priorities in dealing with the potential threats to your vital interests. You have to start with strategy. For the last 20 years, we've been doing nothing but ad hoc. And so, in the meantime, the Navy, since Teddy Roosevelt's time, has always thought offensively. It has been a belief since Mahan's, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan's books, uh, which uh, Mahan was Teddy Roosevelt's greatest advisor, 
And uh, uh, since that time, the Navy has only thought in terms of offense. That the only defense is, is offense and maneuver. And so the Navy had always kept alive uh, the, the, uh, their view of, of the Cold War, starting from you know, the end of World War II, where we, we finished World War II with 7,000 ships. We had 108 aircraft carriers. Huh. And uh, today we're arguing about, uh, we, we have a 274 uh, ship Navy with nine aircraft carriers, effectively. And so uh, they, Reagan was very attracted to, to the thinking that was still going on up at Newport at the Naval War College, where, uh, which has always been the, the sort of temple of strategy uh, in, the, in the US Navy since Mahan taught there, and remains so today. So uh, we helped him put together a, a thought through strategy, a forward strategy, because he kept asking, how do we, uh, of course, we're going, to, we're going to rebuild all the military services. And if I'm elected president, that's, we are going to reestablish the strength of all of the services. But how do we signal to the Soviets that this is a new game in town, that this is not just a blip on the scope, that, that the West is waking up and is going to reestablish their, uh, their confident sense of mission in the world? And uh, and he was totally unhappy with the with what had been the accepted static strategy since the end of World War II, which was containment. And he said it's time to put the pressure on them instead of us reacting to their offenses and intrusions into the into the rest of, of the world. And so we need a forward strategy. And so uh, the Navy had had that Navy and Marine Corps had, had such a strategy always, basically. And as you recall, uh, famously, Admiral Nimitz, after the war, said he never fought a battle in the Pacific that he had not war-gamed in the global games up at Newport. And, uh, and that those war games had continued and are continuing today. And so basically, we provided, uh, when I say we, there are people in this room uh, associated with the Institute who were part of that uh, group that uh, helped to fashion the strategy. And not only to, it's a, not as an armchair issue, but as an operational, uh, immediately uh, executable strategy to reassert naval uh, maritime supremacy and deterrence while rebuilding all of the, the services. And uh, at one of the meetings during the transition after he had been reelected, he asked us, but what can we do right away? I don't want to wait. You know, we had a, uh, a part of building the 600 ship Navy. There were some skeptics that w thought it would take 20 years. And while we told him that no, we can reactivate battleships, we can reactivate uh, some still very good destroyers and cruisers, and we can uh, uh, start uh, uh, implementing a real competition and start building right away so that we can <coughs> build a 600 ship Navy, uh, if not in your first term, certainly midway through your second term. You don't have to wait 30 years like all the skeptics say. But more important, we can give you an option right away in your first year in office to show there's a new game in town. And so what we, uh, what we did, is NATO had for, since World War II really, been uh, doing these exercises, multi-ship exercises, practicing uh, interoperability, the Royal Navy, the US Navy, Royal Navy, Dutch Navy, German Navy, Norwegian Navy, and every year they, uh, they went uh, on exercises all the way from the American Atlantic coast uh, through the Mediterranean. And uh, uh, so uh, we said what we can do is uh, we've got you know, all of the, uh, we, we 
vary from 120 to 200 ships every year with all the NATO navies. And uh, we can, instead of, uh, uh, of, uh, of just doing the normal exercise, which nobody pays any attention to, we can uh, turn left and go north and go up into the Norwegian Sea and around the Norwegian Cape. And we can run practice uh, mirror image strikes right up to the Soviet border and show them that there's nothing they can do about it. They cannot stop us. And we can do the same thing in the Pacific. Although it, 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 it will take us another year to get the Pacific fleet in such a position because we don't have the NATO navies, but we can do it next year there. But right now, this year, we can uh, we can show that this is a totally new strategy and most importantly to prove to them that they cannot deal with it. They cannot stop us not only from sinking their northern fleet but from then using uh, the control of the northern seas to attack their strategic uh, 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 weapons and to strike deep into the Central Front as well. And so he loved the idea. And, uh, uh, but then we said once, once we knew he was very enthused about it, we took him through the details of it. We said, look, um, one little caveat. You can't tell the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, because if it goes into the Joint Chiefs, their, their staff is about 6,000 people strong. <laughs> strong is maybe not the word. Uh, and, uh, and it will leak. And it will set off a whole chain reaction where it, they'll have to study it for five years and you can forget about it. And that's because that's been the problem for the last 20 years, he said, because uh, Joint Chiefs and NATO are studying it. They're doing studies. And uh, you want action, and here's how you can do it. But it has to be limited just to the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. Not that the, the Army uh, uh, had some role to play, but a very minor role to play in this exercise. They certainly have a central role to play in the land war. But the, the fact of, of going into the Norwegian Sea, it was not a joint military operation. It was Navy Marines uh, supported by Air Force AWACS and Air Force B-52s and uh, F-15s. So he said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so that's what happened. In, he, was, he was inaugurated on uh, January 20th. I was sworn in two weeks later. Now you compare that to recent administrations. The whole of the senior B ring, including our distinguished uh, uh, acting secretary of the Air Force here, uh, was in place and uh, ready to go two weeks after inauguration. Now, you know, here we are, 500 days into this administration, and uh, only 40 percent of the of the Pentagon uh, 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 presidential appointments have even been offered, let alone confirmed. And the same in the Bush administration. When we, on the 9-11 Commission, we, uh, uh, we found and, and wrote in the report that one of the things, one of the real contributing factors was that there were only 20% of the uh, presidential appointees in place in the nationals across the board, not just defense, but CIA and uh, the and the NSA and uh, State Department, AID, so forth. Only 20% by September of, the, uh, of his uh, first year. But we had our team there ready to go, and we hit the ground running. And in August, we launched Ocean Venture, which is what the name of this book is, is taken from. And, uh, um, the first time the Russians knew that we were in the Norwegian Sea, we had we sent a hundred, we sent eighty five, we had one hundred and twenty ships south of the GI UK border, and then eighty five of them cut left 
and went up into the Norwegian Sea, including four aircraft carriers. <laughs> and the first that the Soviets knew that we were there was uh, Admiral Lyons, the strike fleet commander, sent a flight of F-14s and A-6s a thousand miles from the, hel from the carriers that they launched from up to Murmansk because intelligence had cued us that there was a, a Soviet exercise going on off Murmansk. The first the Russians knew we were there was when these uh, eight jets blew through their exercise at 550 knots. And it just totally gobsmacked them. They had no idea. And it, it, it's just so unthinkable to them because first they didn't think we knew how to operate up there because it's, it's nasty weather up there, even in August and September. And so it was a, a, little, a little anecdote. It was very tense because the naysayers in, in the Navy, and there were some, said, you know, in the past, in the Cold War, the Russians have shot down Air Force uh, uh, surveillance aircraft, Navy surveillance aircraft, for far less provocation than this. So we must, you know, this could set off World War III, which was baloney, because we were reading their mail on uh, their most sensitive communications, and we knew what the reaction uh, was when it came and would have been under their own rules uh, of engagement. But nevertheless, there was a certain amount of tension. And when, as soon as they knew we were up there, they launched everything, bears, bisons, badgers, uh, all the ships they had available, submarines, they all came out to look for the carriers. And uh, the first one that came around the, the Cape, uh, we had two F-14s intercepted just north of the North Cape. And it was a big TU-95, and they have uh, blisters, waste blisters, and they're mainly used for surveillance, but they also have a 21 millimeter cannon that they can put into the, the blister. So the rules of engagement were, if you see the crew uh, starting to mount that, 40, that 21 millimeter, uh, immediately do a split S and get out of there right away. You do not want a... Shooting, <coughs> shooting incident. So uh, the F-14 pilot uh, uh, said to, uh, when F they did the intercept and then pulled back to fly right off the port wing, and uh, he said uh, there is activity in the, the waste blister, and uh, this uh, this is uh, they look like they're serious. And so the Admiral was actually on the comm, which was very unusual, but it was a very sort of obviously sensitive situation. And get out of there immediately if there's <coughs> any indication they're mounting a, a, uh, uh, a, the gun. So then there's a silence, and then the F-14 pilot said, they have not mounted a gun. They have just pasted this month's Playmate of the Month on the plexiglass. <laughs> so yeah, that relieved the tension a, a bit. But uh, to make a long story short, and I'd like to spend leave time for uh, as much questions for as long as you like. We did these exercises. They got better and better every year. Uh, we did them every year at Northern Pacific and the Atlantic. The, uh, southern flank in the Mediterranean, and uh, they got better and better because we, uh, we had about 100 OEG, which were technical analysts, to see what really worked, what tactics worked, what, and we actually showed a lot of classified uh, information because there's no, you're not going to uh, scare anybody if you don't show them what you have. And we knew we were better and could stay better, and so in effect, we declassified some of our tactics and some of our technology to show they could not deal with us. They couldn't stay in the same ocean with us, even though they had more ships than we did. And so, uh, and every, we did, we, we take the lessons learned from each exercise, go back up to Newport, and run them through the war games. We had the global war games, same room that Nimitz did it in the 30s. And same room that they're doing it now, but a little better technology. And uh, come up with good ideas to refine them, discard what didn't work, 
and, uh, uh, and, and use these new ideas, put them into the next year's exercise. So we got better and better, and they got more and more demoralized because they couldn't cope with us. Ultimately, in 85 and 86, we put the carriers into the fjords, into the Norway fjords. And everybody, including a lot of naysayers, uh, including everybody in the Pentagon, said, you can't do that. You can't operate a, an air wing in the fjords. There are 3,000 foot mountains on both sides. It's too narrow. You get willy was and you get uh, snow squalls all the time. There are weird currents, blah, 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 all, all of which is true. Uh, but we knew that we could do it. Now, it, it, I flew on every one of these exercises uh, just to make sure that I you know, I didn't have to wait till it filtered through seven layers of commands. And uh, it's the scariest flying I've ever done, really, because you the weather was foul. There were really snow uh, snowstorms, and it's even worse in the northern Pacific. The sailors often had to climb up the mast with a with a hammer to knock the ice off the revolving so that radars could revolve and. It was, uh, it, it's rough, and the carriers, uh, I remember once breaking out about a thousand feet behind the carrier to land, and it's pure white. They're easy to pick out once you get out, out of the clouds because there was snow on the deck, covering the deck. But it was in like a 3,000 foot, looked like a cliff right in front of the carrier. So it was very nerve wracking, but uh, uh, we proved we were able to do it. And uh, it, we had some hairy times because uh, you are in confined space. So when you've got a, a, a strike group with uh, a two dozen aircraft uh, marshaled behind the carrier, you got to get them all in, and you're headed for uh, for a, uh, a cliff, uh, and you have to turn. Then that means you have to remarshal the whole wedding cake of the aircraft that are are in sequence to to land. But also, if there's snow, and then this one time in particular that, uh, that I was flying on it, if you turn the carrier more than five degrees, it would heel over, of course, because they're going at 25 knots or so, and any aircraft that wasn't chained to the deck would start sliding. And that would be a big, big disappointment to have the air wings slip into the water. So it's. Uh, uh, it's a tough area to operate in, and the Soviets were so complacent, they never dreamed we could operate up there. But we proved that we could. We proved that not only uh, could we do it, we could just put them, put their fleet on the bottom, probably within a week, and we later, from intelligence after the end of the Cold War, confirmed that the longest they ever themselves felt that they could keep their Northern Fleet operation was one week, and so uh, that uh, that really it, it culminated in a message sent by the general staff after the '86 exercises uh, in the Pacific, in RIMPAC, and in the, uh, in the, the Norwegian Sea. That uh, the general staff sent a demarche to the Politburo saying that. He, we have to have our budget trebled for the northern sector, for both the Navy and the Air Force, or we cannot defend the homeland. And that hit like a, like a thunderclap in the Politburo, and it was just what Gorbachev wanted. Because he knew, I mean, they, the, the oil price had collapsed. They, he knew what we now know, that they were spending over 40% of their GDP on defense, not the 8% that CIA said. And, uh, and so he was able then to come back at the general staff, the, the Soviet military, and say, you bankrupted, you know, we spent all of our wealth to achieve what you said would be uh, operational uh, dominance of the West. And we spent all this money, and now we're worse off than we were uh, before you started this massive uh, buildup. So that gave him the leverage he needed to block the Russian uh, uh, defense ministry 
from expanding even further and even continuing the, their great thrust for a maritime uh, buildup. So uh, that led to real negotiations, and that led, uh, and certainly Gorbachev deserves credit, and uh, and certainly. Uh, our uh, State Department and the people that did the negotiating deserve a lot of credit for it, but it was it was the fundamental change of what the Russians call the correlation of power that made that possible. Without that, we'd still be in the Cold War. So let me uh, stop here and uh, and answer any questions. Yes, sir. So, sir, to your point about strategy, when you came into office, was was our old plan for Europe the defense of NATO in Europe, or was it for the defeat of the Soviet Union? It was a very good question. It was for uh, the defense of Europe. It was, and the Navy was had been relegated to the role of of, uh, of convoy. And that's why they weren't allowed to exercise north of the GIUK gap. Yeah. And, and basically, the, in the Carter administration, it was quite explicit and believed by most of the Carter national security people, not all, but most of them, that the Navy had nothing to offer to the battle of the Central Front, and the Central Front was everything to NATO. And so wasting money on aircraft carriers and uh, more attack subs and Anything offensive was a total waste of money. The, the funding should be uh, shifted to the land battle. Uh, and, uh, and that was official policy for really more than four years, because it really started with the Watergate Congress in 74. And uh, the Navy was, you know, it, 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 it had, it, it's just like what's happened the last 10 years with sequester. Uh, starved of spare parts, uh, they froze the pay of everybody. So that when in the squadron that uh, I was in down at Oceana, uh, we had a bus every Friday to take the uh, wives of the enlisted men over uh, to Hampton to uh, to get their uh, uh, food stamps. They were all eligible for welfare, all of them, uh, and that's because in. If you recall in those days, the inflation was got up to 18 percent, yet their uh, uh, military pay had been frozen for almost uh, what, five years. I mean, years yeah, Ty was uh, one of the guys that got it unfrozen. Uh, but uh, so that was uh, uh, that, that really was a. Uh, Strategy that's hard to, you know, it's hard, hard to believe that that was the established strategy, and uh, uh, so it's kind of all gone into the memory hole. Which is one of the reasons why I uh, I wrote this book. Yes, sir. John, you mentioned negotiations right at the end. And you know, I come from an arms control background. Where did Saul start, INF, Peacekeeper, SDI, and the like fit into the strategy you described? Well, I, I think probably you could answer that question. I know it was a rhetorical question you're asking uh, because it, it, it was kept alive in the Arms Control Agency and uh, in, in state, uh, especially by Paul Nitze, who led the group of uh, a very good, realistic um, uh, strategists who understood the process and could see the opportunity. Uh, SALT started in the defeatist days as a way to just accept uh, uh, the reality of what was there. The Soviets, the first uh, SALT-1 uh, was agreed to uh, because the argument went, uh, well, we don't have any new missiles in production, and the Russians uh, have three in, in production. So, and yes, they have a two-to-one uh, majority uh, uh, advantage over us in strategic weapons. But we, it, all this does is, you know, we don't have any leverage because this is the post-Vietnam, post, 
um, uh, post uh, uh, Watergate era when there was no leverage in the executive branch, and uh, and so um, that that uh, uh, that's worth. Uh, I'm sure there's a whole course on that here at the institute. That period of uh, of '74 uh, through '80, uh, uh, where Salt was the, the key uh, argument, because after Salt one, Salt two uh, was negotiated, and uh, and then really uh, never. Uh, that was back in the days when the executive branch. Uh, really believed such th treaties had to be submitted for uh, to the Senate for confirmation. They don't do that anymore. But uh, that assault too uh, was kind of went into the into the abyss when they sent it to the Senate. There was no uh, no wish to confirm uh, uh, that uh, that bad treaty because again it was a it was a one sided treaty that would have uh, killed the Tomahawk missile, for instance. Uh, a lot of the weapon systems that were essential to the future of the Navy uh, were put under strict limits, and yet the Soviet missiles and uh, and the backfire bomber was left out of it. So it was a bad, bad deal. But uh, in the Reagan administration, you know, first of all, Ronald Reagan truly believe what he said in 77 when asked what his Cold War strategy would be. He said, well, it's very straightforward. We win, and they lose. And, uh, uh, and so, and, but he believed firmly that, that we could win without, without conflict, without military conflict. And so he was always ready when the time came to negotiate, and to negotiate a, uh, a fair uh, reduction in arms, which he believed in. And, uh, and when, they, when the first proposals were way out of line, i.e. disarm the Navy first, and, uh, uh, and uh, give up Star Wars, it's interesting Star Wars is, Star Wars came out of a Cywar program that Bill Casey was the main author of, but that Reagan loved, and uh, uh, he uh, uh, and, and Reagan came to believe in it as a real program, and because he believed in it, the Russians believed, Soviets believed in it, and so they demanded at Reykjavik giving up uh, giving up Star Wars along with the Navy uh, reduction proposals, and. Reagan basically told them to go pound sand and came home. And that led then to more realistic uh, disarmament proposals. So it's, it's, a, it's a great story in itself, but you could write that book better than I. <laughs>